All right, so the part of the chapter I'm going to focus in on this morning in Matthew chapter 12 is the very first part there. We see the story here of Jesus Christ and his disciples. They're, they're walking through a field of, and there's corn growing and it's the Sabbath day. And he's walking through with his disciples and they're plucking some corn while they're walking and eating the corn as they go. And the Pharisees see that and they want to call him out and they're saying, hey, wait a minute here, look at verse number two. It says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Now we know from Scripture, obviously, the, uh, the Pharisees were people that emphasized the wrong things. They didn't have a good understanding of Scripture at all. I mean, they weren't saved. You know, when they're, when they're teaching these things, they, they, they put the doctrines of men above the doctrines of God, and they really focused in on, on, on the wrong things. They had a complete, gross misunderstanding of Scripture. So here they are, and they're saying, oh, man, what are you guys doing? You're eating corn. On, you know, they're, they're, they're out doing the Lord's work, and they're just picking up corn while they're walking through it, eating, and they're giving them a hard time about it. Now, we're going to go through a lot of this, but what I want to point out, and what, this, what the, the sermon this morning is really about is when Jesus answers them, the way he rebukes them, he says, have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? And he says this multiple times in the Bible. He says, have ye not read? And the title of the sermon this morning is, Have Ye Not Read? And I want to go over the importance of reading the Bible and making sure that you are going through for yourself all of God's Word, not just bits and pieces, not just a little bit here, a little bit there, not just your daily devotional of like reading a verse in the morning, but I mean reading your Bible and getting in. Because in order to understand these doctrines, and here's one of the, is a big doctrine, right? It's a doctrine of the Sabbath day. And especially in the Old Testament when it was being observed, you know, that's a major thing. You need to understand all of the ins and outs of, of what the Sabbath day entails and what's right to do and what's not right to do. And the only way you could know that is by reading, by knowing, by hearing from God's Word. So I'm going to keep reading here in this passage. He says, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they, they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. So he gives them this example. He said, Oh, you're going to give me a hard time about eating the corn here. Well, have you never read this story? when David was hungry and his men that were with him. And this is true, right? The, the, the Bible says that the showbread that was there in the temple was only to be for the priests. Like no one else was allowed to eat that at all. And, and um, it was holy to the Lord. But when he came and he was hungry and there was no food to be found anywhere, then the priests allowed it and this is a story re recorded in scripture and this is a story recorded in scripture that Jesus Christ is saying there was no problem with them doing that I mean clearly he's saying haven't you read that that what David did that was there was no problem with them doing that even though technically it was against the law in this situation it was okay it was it was one of these things where I mean, the guys need to eat, you know? I mean, you need to eat to survive. There, there's certain situations here where you could get into where, like, it's life. It's, it's similar to the situations where people are being praised, like uh, Rahab the harlot, for lying to the people who are coming to kill the messengers, to kill the, the people who went to spy out the land, right? Now, we know that bearing a false witness is a sin. It's against the table. Yet she was being praised for doing righteously by hiding them and saving their life from people who are, who are out and, and ready to kill them because they were doing God's work. They were in the right. They were walking in the Spirit and doing what was right, and they protected them um, in that circumstance. So uh, we see this here. This is another one of those circumstances. Look at verse number 5. He says, Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So he says here, you're condemning the guiltless. Was there a problem with him and his disciples or his disciples picking up the corn and eating it? No. Jesus Christ said they are guiltless. Now we're going to see here what the Bible says and why they were even hung up on this and thinking about that because you can find Scripture to support what they were saying. 
You could find scripture that says, hey, no, look, you, know, you need to do this. But what they did was they omitted the weightier matters. He, he says, but if he had known what this meaneth, if you would have known what it means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, he says, then you would understand. Then you would realize what, uh, what is being taught here and what the truth is and, and, and that you wouldn't just be condemning people that, who, are, who are guiltless, who are actually not in violation of breaking any laws. See, and, and I want to make this clear. Jesus isn't just like some softy who just says, well, everything goes now. And, and, and he, was, you know, he was being slanderously reported that, that basically he was thinking that the law of Moses didn't, didn't matter. And, and teaching people contrary to the law of Moses. That was the claim that the Pharisees made, but that's not the truth at all. Jesus Christ did believe in the law of Moses. He did observe the laws of Moses, but he knew what all of the scripture meant, and they, fall, they, they didn't understand the law of Moses. You know, and, and it was clear when he says, you know, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. They didn't really believe Moses. They picked and chose you know, the things that they liked. And we're going to get to some of that later too. The things that, that they wanted to focus on versus the things that they didn't want to focus on and have a lot more liberty from the law. And they were not um, righteous in their, in their dividing there. Now, one of the main reasons you need to read the Bible is to have you not read is to understand doctrine. And doctrine is extremely important. Understanding doctrine. What do you believe about what the Bible teaches? What do you believe about anything comes from your doctrine. It comes from God's Word. In order to thoroughly understand specific doctrines, you need to have thoroughly read the Bible. You have to consider the whole when you look into the small section. See, if you want to learn anything about a subject, it will good, one of the good ways to do that in the Bible is try to look up every time that subject is mentioned. Right? You want to know about any specific sin. You want to know about the Sabbath day. You can go through. You can get a concordance. You can do word searches. You can try to find, hey, where does the Bible talk about this? And go and read those passages. But here's the thing. If you haven't read the Bible cover to cover, if you don't know the context of all of those different passages that you're reading, you're going to be very easy to get into false doctrine. You have to have the whole picture. You have to have the broad understanding. You have to know where things fit in. You can't just go and look. I mean, you could find some scripture references and maybe it'll be in the book of Job and it'll be Job's friends talking and then you're going to be like, oh, see, look, this is in the Bible and use that to support some belief. When you find out at the end, God says, look, what Job's friends were saying, they were wrong. And what Job said was right. So you have to understand that. Now, it doesn't mean that every single statement that they made was false, but you got to keep that in mind. You can't just go and have, that's my proof text. It's what, you know, Eliphaz the Temanite says, or, you know, Bildad the Shuhite said and to Job, like, that's where you're getting your doctrine from. You won't know that, though, unless you have read the Bible in total. And you also have to be careful and say, oh, well, I think this says, you know, one thing. Were, that would be contradictory to many other statements within the Bible. For example, you know, James chapter 2, the Bible says, faith without works says, you know, can faith save him? And you read that, if you just were reading that, you might say, oh, well, maybe faith can't just save you. Maybe you need to have works too. And just the way that that one passage is written, you might start to think, oh, well, maybe there's something else involved. But when you have the, whole, the Bible as a whole and you have it in context and you know, no, 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 I've read over and over and over again, Faith without, you know, that, that we're saved by grace through faith without works. We know, you know, I've seen that plenty of times. I know that. I've heard that taught. So when you have the whole context, you could understand these things and be safer digging into specific subjects. But you have to read. Understanding the law on the Sabbath day is a great example of this. We're gonna, and we're going to look into this a little bit deeper. The Pharisees seem to pick certain things in the law and focus on them more than what was even more important. So look at, um, turn if you would to Exodus chapter 20 because we're going to see where the, the command is on the Sabbath day. I'm going to read for you from Matthew 23, verse 23, when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. 
See, they were focused on, you know, tithing, for example. And they, and they were tithing on the smallest of things, on just these little herbs, right? They're supposed to tithe on their increase. And they're tithing on, on just all the way down to just the smallest little thing. And they were so focused on that. And he says, look, that's great that you did that. That's why he says, and not to leave the other undone. He said, you should have done that. He says, but you were so focused on that, you've just completely skipped over the big things, the important things, you know, judgment, mercy, and faith. This is what I'm trying to teach you through the law. And you've just completely, that's just gone right over your head and you're just focused on these little details. And that's why he said to him earlier in our, in our opening passage, but if you had known what this mean, meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You notice he mentioned mercy there. He mentioned mercy also in Matthew 23 when he was rebuking him. He's like, you don't even know anything about mercy. They didn't understand the laws that they were focusing on. And, and it, it was evident from that opening passage. They misunderstood the scope of the law and its purpose. The scope meaning how far can you go with the law? How, to what extent are you going to enforce that Sabbath day law? Right? And, that, and, and, they, and they, they had the idea that it just gets enforced completely, just, just without any exception whatsoever. You know, if, if, if there's a man that's just dying and it's a Sabbath day, you can't go, like, do anything to save them. You can't do anything. You know, that's their view of the way that the Sabbath day law was supposed to be. They didn't understand the scope of the law. They didn't understand the purpose of the law, that the law, you know, the Sabbath day wasn't given for, for God. It was given for us. And we're going to see that. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8. The Bible reads, and this is, this is from the Ten Commandments, right? In Exodus chapter 20, verse number 8 reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Pretty straightforward here in this passage, right? It's saying not to work. It's a day of rest. It's not a day of work. And you get the view, the overall view of what this passage is saying. You know, there's, you have six days to do your work. Because we all got to work. I mean, we got we to gotta work to provide. We got to work to provide for the family and, and, and eat and everything else. You know, there's work that needs to be done. And he says, you've got six days to do that work. But on the seventh day, it's a day of rest. I don't want any work being done. I don't want you working. I don't want your servants working. You know, you have employees. I don't want any work being done on the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. It's pretty straightforward, right? Turn, if you would, to Exodus 35. We're going to see a little bit, a little bit more at it here, not just to, uh, you know, to, to kind of the extent. We're trying to look out and see, hey, how far should this law go? What is the extent and the scope of this law? Exodus 35, verse number 2. Bible reads, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So now we're starting to see, okay, he said not to do any work, not to even kindle a fire. So that's getting pretty, pretty specific. He's saying, okay, there's a lot of things here. He's saying, I really want to make sure that you're not doing work. And it was so serious. He says, you know, anyone who's, who's guilty of this is going to be put to death. There's a high punishment, uh, you know, on, on breaking this particular law. So it's something that God treats seriously. So we can gain that also from the text. Turn, if you would, to Exodus 16. And we're going to see here now the, the part where the Pharisees probably would have turned to to say that the disciples should not have been eating corn on the Sabbath day. They shouldn't have been plucking ears of corn and eating them. This is where they would have gotten their text from. Verse number 23 of Exodus 16 reads, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, 
and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And this is when the manna was being provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness. This is when they were being fed by God. They were being fed angels' food by God. The manna would, would show up on the ground in the morning. And they would go out and collect it. And whatever they collected was just enough that was sufficient for them. It says some people, you know, gathered much and they had nothing left over. And those that gathered little had no lack. There was no, you know, everybody had exactly what they needed when they would go out and collect this food. But it was a little bit of work. They had to get up in the morning. They had to actually go out, physically go and, and, and gather the food. And what he was saying here, the law was... They were, and they also weren't allowed to store up any of the manna for the next day. He says, because if they did that, then it would breed worms and it would stink. And there's another miracle in this provide, provision of the manna. He says, okay, on Friday, the day before the Sabbath, you are going to save some up. Any other day that you do that, it's going to breed worms and stink. But on this specific day, it's going to stay. It's going to be good. It's, you, you, your, your food needs to be prepared already, however you want to eat it. Have it done the day before because guess what? On the Sabbath day, there's not going to be any manna out there for you to get because I don't want you, um, you know, breaking the Sabbath and going out and working and collecting this food. You're going to just eat from that which you already have. This was the law that was given. This is what God designed and when he was giving them the manna. So this is where I would say they would say, oh, okay, well, you're not supposed to be gathering food and eating it on the Sabbath day, right? I mean, you could see where they might come to that conclusion, but that was false. It was wrong because what were they doing? Think about this. Were they just living at home and going out and, and gathering their food on the Sabbath when Jesus and his disciples were out preaching the gospel and out doing the work of God? No. They weren't just sitting at home and just decided, hey, I'm going to get up on the Sabbath and go out and collect my food and do work on the Sabbath, which is forbidden. That's not what they were doing. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 7. We're going to see a very similar example to, to what they did, uh, talking about the disciples, what they, what they accused Jesus of in John chapter 7. Because the, it's the same reason. Now, this isn't Jesus collecting food, but it's Jesus healing in John chapter 7. But either way, it's, it's in the Pharisees' eyes, breaking the Sabbath, right? Look at John chapter 7, verse 21. The Bible reads, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circum circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So what Jesus is doing here, he's pointing out, see, they, they wanted to kill him because he healed on the Sabbath day. He actually healed people that, were, that had all kinds of diseases, all kinds of problems, and made them whole again. A miracle. He performed a miracle of God on the Sabbath day, and they wanted to put him to death because, oh, you broke the Sabbath day. That's the spirit that they had. That's the way that they viewed the law. Not understanding mercy, not understanding judgment, not judging righteously, not understanding even the simple fact. He points this out. He says, the way that you understand the law is a contradiction already within Scripture. Why? Because Moses gave the law, right? And part of that law was to circumcise a child on the eighth day. It had to be the eighth day after they were born. A male child is circumcised eight days after birth. Well, guess what? If it's eight days after birth, one of those days is going to end up being a Sabbath day. For some people, there's going to be Sabbath days where the eighth day, hey, this child needs to be circumcised. Well, guess what? They're doing a work then. They're actually performing a circumcision. And he says, in order to keep the law, you've got to circumcise the child. Guess what's being done on a Sabbath day? So the way that you understand the Sabbath day and the work that isn't supposed to be done, you, you, you're misinterpreting, you're misunderstanding it. You allow that to happen, you don't say anything. And circumcision is literally removing flesh. I mean, you're, you're not making them whole. You're taking something away. He says, I'm just making them complete. 
You think it's fine for, for them to be circumcised and have something taken away and I'm just making them whole and fixing them and making them better and all of a sudden this is not good and that's okay? You know, they're hypocrites. They don't understand the law. And in Matthew 12 where we started, he makes this, the clear statement. Verse 11 he says, And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you and this is, in, again, in regards to the corn. So you say, well, how does that apply to them plucking the corn? Because they weren't making anybody whole, right? It says, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? He's saying, look, if one of your animals gets, gets stuck in a pit and it's going to die or whatever, you know, like, you're going to go and help it out of the pit. And this is, he was also pointing out their hypocrisy because they were doing these things. If they saw their sheep in a pit and that Sabbath day, they would go and get them out. He says, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Jesus clearly just spells it out for him. He says, Look, if you're doing good, even if you're doing work, if you are doing well, if you are doing good and what's right, that's lawful. And what they were doing, Jesus and his disciples were doing well. They were going out and serving God. They were going out and performing the work that God had set before them. That's why Jesus said, you know, my father worketh hitherto and I work also. He was doing the work of the law which made, or the, of God, which made it lawful on that day for him to do that work. He wasn't going and building a house. He wasn't being a carpenter. He wasn't building anything with wood and working that way. He wasn't going out and collecting food to provide for his family. He was doing God's work. And God's work is done all the time. And when people are hungry because they're following Jesus everywhere and they don't even have a home, to, you know, a place to rest their head, and they pull some, some corn from a corn stalk to eat because they're hungry in the way while they're doing God's work, he says, that's fine. That is righteous judgment. He says, you don't understand the law at all to, to condemn the guiltless. And it's all a result of them, he says, have you not read? Haven't you seen this? Haven't you seen these other... How can you come up with your weird, bizarre, false doctrine where you want to condemn everybody when we have these other places in Scripture that can help you understand this? We need to make sure that we are reading and that we are reading carefully. And even the, even the Levites, if you think about... The Levites had continual sacrifices going on. I mean, there was morning and evening sacrifices that went on seven days a week. There were sacrifices that had, so, and guess what? That's work. When you're processing and butchering an animal and offering it up as a sacrifice, the Levites were doing work on the Sabbath day all the time. But why was that allowed? I mean, God put the death penalty on, the, on breaking the Sabbath day. Well, it's because they were working for the Lord. They were doing that which is right. That was not, that did not fall under the scope of breaking the Sabbath day. And you could understand that by reading all of the scripture and understanding the spirit in which the law was given and what the purpose is too. That it's not designed for, you know, discouraging serving God. Right. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 19. I'm going to read for you just, just the last closing on this point here about the Sabbath day. I'm going to read to you for a, a verse from Nehemiah chapter 13. When Nehemiah was getting everything right, you know, the children of Israel had come back into Jerusalem and they are rebuilding everything. And he was, he was getting everything going again, getting things started, and they were going to have a, a Passover and everything else. They were, um, he's like, we need to, to observe the Sabbath thing. But people kept coming in and selling stuff, and they had to close the gates. He's like, look, this isn't going to happen anymore. You know, we're going to put this to rest right now. We're going to stop this. I'm going to make sure. And he, you know, he told the people because they came, and they even came and like sat outside the gates because they just wanted to keep selling and stuff, and they didn't care about the Sabbath day. And he, he basically threatened them. He's like, look, you guys come back here again. You know, you're going to wish you hadn't come back in. I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing that. But one of the things that he did in order to preserve the Sabbath day, I'm going to read this for you. Nehemiah 13 verse 22 says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, oh my God, concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. He put them to work 
guarding, watching the gates to make sure that nobody was going to come in and profane the Sabbath day. So you could say, how is that possible? Because they were doing the work of God. They were doing what was right. They were trying to sanctify the Sabbath day. Did it require some work? Yes, it did. But they were sanctifying the Sabbath day from those who really were polluting it as opposed to, you know, going to, up to the Levite and saying, what are you doing here standing guard and watching over this gate? Don't you know you're not supposed to be working on the Sabbath day? It's completely fine and righteous, and actually it was a good thing. That actually helped them to sanctify the Sabbath day. But you have to read the Scripture. You have to read all of it. You can't just look at one verse. You can't just look at one section in order to form your entire doctrine, especially on something like this, like we're like working on the Sabbath day. What's the scope? Where does it measure? Well, you have to read. Now we're going to look at another time here in Matthew 19 where Jesus asked them, have you not read? And this is another question on the law. They were misapplying the, the Sabbath law, which really is, is a good law for us. I mean, <laughs> anybody that works hard or work, you know, to work six days a week and just God says, okay, look, you just have to rest. That's, that's a good, that's a benefit for us, right? It's not one of those things like, you know, you might, you might look at something if you were living in the Old Testament, having to travel to Jerusalem to, you know, get all your kids together, get all your stuff together to go and, and pay your tithe or to go and do, you know, do whatever. Those might seem more burdensome. But I mean, keeping the Sabbath day, you're like, oh, wait, I don't have to work? <laughs> and wait, no, wait, not only do I not have to, I can't work? You're forcing me to take a day off? Okay, you know, I mean, really, it, who would, who would want to fight against that? Like, just one day, just, in, just getting right. I mean, I understand what it's like to want to get work done and do some work, but man, it just, God says, no, you have to do this. That's a good thing. And, and, and this is the way that they were viewing that. It's like they were making it bad. They were making it like despised in people's eyes because of the way they wanted to enforce the Sabbath day as opposed to it being an actual blessing. But see, now we're going to see the flip side. We're going to see where they don't like the law very much the way that it ought to be enforced and they want to start making excuses to get out of the law. Look at Matthew 19, verse number 3. The Bible reads, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And you see here, they're trying to get away with it. I was like, well, is it lawful just to put away your wife for every cause? I mean, just anything that comes up, if I just feel like divorcing my wife, can I just divorce my wife? Is that lawful? And that's the way they wanted it to be. They wanted to be able to just get a divorce for any reason. They didn't care about God's law. They didn't care how it was from the beginning. And Jesus explained to him, he's like, no, 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 no. He says, have you not read? Don't you understand marriage? Don't you understand what God's teaching you about being married? That what God has joined together, let not man put aside. Don't divorce your wife. God brought you together. You got married before the Lord and you made vows till death do us part. And now you want to just divide that up? He said, don't divide what God has brought together. But see, look at, their, look at verse number 7 again. This is the way that they view the law. This is the way that they look at it. And it's completely wrong. Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? To say, well, then why did Moses tell us to divorce her? Did Moses tell them in the law to divorce their wives? No. There was an allowance. There was one exception made within the law where where it wouldn't be a sin to divorce your wife. That was what was put there. It wasn't Moses' command. Well, why did Moses tell us to divorce our wife then? 
This is the way that they viewed it. Why? Because they wanted to get away with their sin and they wanted to justify themselves and their wicked hearts to allow themselves to do whatever they wanted and to not have to observe God's laws. The ones that were good, they were being really strict on and didn't want to, you know, anything good come out of that. And then the ones here that would have impacted them where they actually would have had to keep some kind of righteous living and, and doing what's right here and not be able to divorce their wives, didn't want to obey that one. Amen. So they're looking for every loophole. And look at what Jesus said. He says, look, and, and he, re he addresses their response. He says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, which means he allowed it. He allowed it. He didn't command you to do it. He allowed it to happen because your hearts are hard. He says, but from the beginning it was not so. That was something that was allowed in the Mosaic law. He says in the beginning, God made a male and female. He says, look, you're brought together. You're married. Don't divide that asunder. That's the way it is, and that's the way God wanted it to be. But in the Mosaic law, he says, it was allowed but he clarifies this too. Because people these days want to say, oh, well, it's allowed then, right? So God allowed there to be divorce. Yeah, in one specific situation. And Jesus explains very carefully what that is. He says, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. That's the caveat. That is the case where he says, unless it's for fornication, he says, if you put away your wife and marry another, you're committing adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. He says, that's what it is. Because in God's eyes, you're still married. When you, when you get divorced for any of these other reasons, he says, when you marry someone and put them away, he says, accept it be for fornication. Now, that word fornication is important there. And as you go, and I'm not going to go back and prove this. You can look up the, the references for yourself. Go, go look up the Old Testament law that talks about this. We need to understand today, even though things aren't the same in our culture, that in the past, when people get married, they would be espoused unto their, their, their husband or their wife, but the marriage was not consummated. They didn't actually join together right away. See, these days when, when, uh, when people get married, you, you, you have your ceremony, you say your vows, you, you, have, you, you get married, and then usually right away the marriage is consummated. The man and the woman come together in union and, and, the, mar you know, and the marriage becomes complete. That's not the way it's always been done. Oftentimes there was, there was the, you know, the, the marriage, but then the consummation came much later. And this is the way it is when you look at Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary were espoused, and Joseph was considering divorcing her when he found out that Mary was with child. Now, obviously, that was a special case because she was a virgin and she was the one who gave birth to Jesus Christ, a virgin birth. And, um, but Joseph, obviously, if any normal man is going to be like, there's only one way you're getting pregnant, right? And, and I would have loved to hear that conversation. That they had. <laughs> no, no, really, an angel told me. <laughs> but, but, but praise God, you know, they were both righteous. They were righteous people. And, uh, and, and he stayed together and he, and he believed her and it was true. It was, it was obviously a fact. And, um, you know, and he was told to, by name, you know, that, that, that which is in there, he said, you know, don't, you don't have to divorce your wife. But that was the circumstance. Joseph, being a just man, the Bible says, was minded to put her away privily. He was just, he would have been just according to the law. They had not consummated the marriage yet. And to find out that she had been unfaithful, or that she had, you know, at, at one point, got, you know, done this, she was not a virgin, to be able to then say, well, I'm going to get a divorce, that was allowed, that was acceptable. Committing fornication is something that happens uh, prior to people, you know, the marriage being consummated because that would be adultery then once you are married and you, commit, and, and you commit fornication with someone else, it's called adultery. And he didn't say adultery here, he said it's for fornication. So anyways, I, I, I like teaching on this. It's an important doctrine, and, and this is one of the very few churches that you'll actually hear that taught in. Most churches will never touch it for a second. Why? Because the divorce rate is so high, and people don't want to hear that. And people don't want to hear that, well, I've already been divorced. Does that mean I can't get married again? Well, yeah, not until your spouse dies. And again, I'm not going to preach the entire sermon on this, but I love you, and I want you to understand this. And it doesn't mean that if you're divorced today and you're in this room that I hate you. It's, it's exactly the opposite. I care about you, but I'm going to tell 
tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you what God thinks. I'm going to tell you what Jesus thinks. And I'm going to tell you that this is what the Bible says. I will not withhold that from you. If you're divorced, you're totally welcome here. We love you. Why don't you be a part of the church? But if you decide to get remarried to someone when, you're, when your ex-spouse is still alive, you're committing adultery. That's what the Bible says. And that's what the Pharisees didn't want to hear. And that's what a lot of people don't want to hear, but that's what Jesus Christ himself said. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 22. You're in Matthew 19, just a few pages over. Matthew 22. And we're going to see another, one more, one more um, section, portion of Scripture where Jesus said, Have you not read? And this time he's talking to the Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were both false teachers and false prophets. And they did not understand the Bible. And so here we're going to see one more question brought forth. And it's in uh, verse number 28 of Matthew 22. The Bible reads, Therefore, in the resurrection, the Sadducees made this great story of, of this woman who was married to seven brothers. Like, the first man had her to wife, and then he died. And, and you know, the, the law was that the, the brother was supposed to then take her to wife to raise seed unto his deceased brother. And he's like, there's seven brothers, right? And they just kept dying one after the other, so she kept on becoming the wife of each brother, but never had any children. And they're like, okay, okay, Mr. Smart Guy, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. They're like, so in the resurrection... You know, when we're raised from the dead and now all these people are together, whose wife is she going to be? Right? I mean, they all had her to wife, so how could, she's not going to be the wife of all seven of them in the resurrection. So, so how do you answer that, Jesus? Huh? They, you know, that's kind of how they were coming at him. And it says in verse 28, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. He said, You're in error. You're wrong. Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read? See the answer again. Haven't you read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You so you don't believe in a resurrection? Haven't you even read the most basic thing that God has told you? I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob after they had already deceased and passed on. He's like, God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Amen. That's enough for you to understand that there is a resurrection, knowing that God is a God of the living. And he rebuked them for that. And he's saying, look, haven't you read? How can you not understand? Have you not read? Jesus expected people to read. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 3. Their lack of understanding, just as our lack of understanding, ultimately is going to be a result of being unread. Now, none of us is going to be perfect in our understanding. I get that. But, you know, theoretically, we could be if we had enough, you know, if we've been reading enough of the Bible and had enough of it in to be able to understand it. God could grant the understanding. But, um... I mean, obviously, we don't get to that point. The, the, the Bible is so deep as it is anyways. But any time there's a lack of understanding or a false doctrine, it could be found corrected from God's Word. I mean, there's, there's never an excuse to have false doctrine. It's, it, it all is written there plainly for us. It's just our own lack of understanding. Oftentimes, though, more often than not, people get, get suckered into false doctrines because they are not read themselves because they don't know what the Bible says and they're being taught a certain way and the problem lies on their shoulders. If you have not read, the problem is with you. Look at John chapter 3, verse 3. We're going to see here where Jesus was expecting Nicodemus to understand certain things. Real basic concept about being born again. Look at verse number 3. John 3.3, 3, the Bible reads, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Great soul winning verse. You've got to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? 
So he didn't understand. Jesus it was explaining to him, look, you know, because Nicodemus is in there, and he's like, how can a man be born when he's old? Like, what are you talking about born again? Like, I'm a grown man. I can't go back into my mother's womb and be born again. So what are you talking about? And Jesus, you know, he, he explains them. He's, he's, he's showing long suffering here. He says, look, you got to be born of water and of the Spirit. Born of water, he's not talking about baptism as so many people falsely teach. When a, a person is born in the flesh or physically, the woman's water breaks and you're born of water or from the water. You're born that way physically, but that which is born of the Spirit. And, that, and that's why he says, you say, oh, well, that's not what that means. How can you say that that's what it means? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit because the next verse, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Right. There are two births. The water birth and the spirit birth. And then there's two births that he goes in the very next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Being born of water is the physical birth. That's the fleshly verse, ver, uh, birth. And then being born of the spirit is the spiritual birth. And that's what he's explaining here to Nicodemus. He's saying, look, don't marvel I said to be born again. You know, it's not, it shouldn't be some big wonder. But then Nicodemus answers and says, well, how can, this, how can those things be? He didn't understand it at all. And look at what Jesus answered him in verse number 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? He said, You're a master? You're a, fair, you're a teacher? I mean, you're, 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 you're a rabbi? And you don't even know this? You don't even know that you need to be born again? How, how in the world can you be in your position and not know these things? Jesus expected him to know these things. He didn't read I mean, and, and see, this is great proof that people have always been saved by grace through faith, that people always needed to be born again, whether they lived in the Old Testament or whether they lived in the New Testament. Because this still would be in the Old Testament time when they were still observing Old Testament laws before Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again from the dead. They still were in that Old Covenant era. And he expected the Pharisee, Nicodemus, to know that he needed to be born again. Right. It was already, he should have known that. Now, Jesus would not have held him responsible and not have rebuked him that way if he says, oh, well, yeah, but of course you're under the old covenant, so you needed to, to do the sacrifices in order to be saved. No. You need to be born again. That's why the law was given, is to point you that you need salvation, that you're not good enough, that you can't keep the law. That's what it's there for. That's the purpose. It's not because you can actually keep it and go to heaven. It's so that you can put your faith on the Lord and be born again. Amen. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Now, a lot, many people have questions about the Bible, and questions aren't bad. You know, I mean, there's some questions that might be a stupid question, but overall, I mean, when you have questions about the Bible, it's not a bad thing. And I'm not just trying to discourage you from asking questions. It's good to seek godly counsel. We've gone over that before. But the answer should always go back to Scripture. That should always be, you know, any question you have, it should always just be, well, how readest thou? And then we see here with Jesus Christ was approached by a man. In Luke 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is it written in the law? How readest thou? So he asks him a question. He responds with a question. You know, the guys say, well, wait, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He's saying, well, how do you read it? What does the Bible say? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Yep, you got it. Just, just do that. Right? <laughs> and of course, this is someone that was tempting him. He wasn't, he wasn't at really interested in the truth. He just was trying to, to test Jesus and, and not really care what he had to say so much as try to catch him in his words. But... Um, you know, the, the answer there is, well, well, what's written? How do you read in the Bible? And you should be answering or asking yourself that when you have questions, you know, well, what does the Bible say about that? And try to study things out for yourself. You know, like I said, I, I want to discourage people from asking questions, but the first thing you should be doing is praying to God to open up your understanding and looking for the answers yourself. 
That's, what, that, that's the attitude we all should have and not relying on someone else. See, the problem is when, when people get too used to just asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, well, now you're just relying on me or somebody else to just, to just tell you what the Bible says. Read it for yourself. You need to be responsible for reading the Bible for yourself. And oftentimes, if you come to me and ask me a question, I'll ask you, well, what do you think? And, and honestly, most people that come to me with questions already know the answer to their question. Yeah. Most people do. And I know that I was the same way. I would ask questions and, I, you know, it's like you already know the answer. You just kind of want someone to, to tell you, <laughs> someone else to, to confirm that that's right or whatever. And again, you know, you, you have a question, fine. You know, come to me with a question, that's fine. But what you, what you really need to be focusing on, though, is trying to find the answer in the Bible yourself by reading. And you want some help with, with some clarification, I'm, I'm happy to help you, but, but really go back to, well, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about this? Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 17, real quickly. Acts chapter 17. Actually, you know what? No, skip that. Just go to Deuteronomy 8. I'm kind of running a little bit short on time. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to read for you from Acts 17 because here's the thing. Hearing the Bible preached and taught is a great way to learn, obviously. I mean, that's, that's why we're, I'm preaching this morning. We're, we're, you, know, you come to church, we sing praises, we fellowship, we edify one another, and you're going to hear the Bible preached. And that is something that God ordained. That's a way of learning that is important. That's a way that, that ought to be done. But whatever you hear and whatever you learn, you need to always examine it and check it against the Word of God. Because when you're hearing a man preach, you're doing exactly that. You're hearing a man preach. I'm just a man. I am not a God man. I may be a man of God, but I'm not a God man. Jesus Christ was a God man. You can trust every word that came out of his mouth. I am not a God man. I'm a man of God up here trying to teach the Bible, but I am imperfect. And you can't know 100% for certain ever that anybody is not going to try to lead you astray for whatever reason. Even if it's just because they're deceived. So you need to match everything that you hear in church with Scripture. We see a good example of that in Acts 17. I'll just read this for you, verses 11 and 12. The Bible reads, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. They're saying, hey, those people in Berea, they were more honorable than the people in Thessalonica. They were more honorable because they listened they heard the word of God preached. They would listen to Paul. They would listen to his apostles. They would hear them. But then what they would do, they'd go back and they'd search the scripture and say, well, is what they're saying right? Is that, is that really true? Is, what, you know, is, is this what's expected of me? Is this what I need to do? Is this how we get saved? Is this how we get born again? Is that what the Bible says? And they were checking it for themselves daily. They searched the scriptures daily because they cared about what God's word said. It, and it's great. You know, and, and they received it. It says, hey, they received those words. They received them gladly. It's great to receive the preaching, but make sure that you're checking it and not just accepting it. There's a lot of people that are preaching these days that are great people and my personal friends and people that I love, but you can never just assume that anything that any of them are saying is going to be right, Amen. no matter what. I know them personally. I think that their hearts are great, but you can't accept it because pastor so-and-so said so. Listening to preaching online is great. I do it too. I listen to other people preach, but don't let that be a substitute for reading your Bible. Put the priority on you reading first. Don't ever skip out on your Bible reading because, oh, well, I listened to some preaching today, so that's my Bible reading for the day. No, it's not. And that shouldn't be the way that you handle it. How much should you read? You're in Deuteronomy chapter 8. You say, I get it. You know, Jesus was talking to people. How, you know, have you not read? Have you not read? Obviously, we need to read the Bible. Well, how much should we be reading? How much? It's a good question, right? Say, I want to do what's right. I want to make sure that I am reading my Bible so that Jesus doesn't come to me saying, have you not read? Right? Because I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be rebuked. Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1. The Bible reads, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live 
and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That, that manna that was fed for the children of Israel in the wilderness served a very important purpose. And the manna is actually symbolic of the Word of God. And he said he was teaching them that, you know what, when you got up every day in the morning, you collected that manna. And every day you were provided for, he says, it humbled you. It humbled you to be in that situation. It humbled you to go hungry. It humbled you to rely on the Lord for you to be provided for. It humbled you for that. And that was all done to teach you. To teach you that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we view our life as needing to survive by needing every word of God, which is the whole Bible cover to cover, my friends. We need to live by every word of God. Just as much as you need to eat to survive, you need every word of God to survive. Then I'll let you answer that question. How often do you think you should be reading? Think about how often you eat. How many days do you go without eating? And then ask yourself, how many days do you go without reading the Bible? without reading scripture. And then ask yourself, how much do you eat? Versus how much do you read? Do you read one verse? Well, do you take one kernel of corn and eat that for, you know, for your dinner? He's re relating the two. The food, the nourishment that we need for our physical flesh versus the food that we need for our spirit, which is through the word of God. When you ask yourself how often you should read, think about that and keep that in mind to give yourself a guide. I'm not going to give you the guideline. I, I use personally for myself, and this is not in Scripture that, that this is you know, the minimum or anything like that. I hold myself to a minimum standard. I always have, and I think this is a pretty good standard of reading, making sure you get through the Bible cover to cover at least once a year. And I do that with my family. I do out loud reading. And that has nothing to do with my own personal reading and studying and everything else that I do. But that is just something that I have set aside for myself. It is not very difficult. And like I said, I think that's a minimum. That's about roughly, if you spend roughly 15 minutes a day reading some Bible, you can get the Bible read cover to cover in one year. We do four chapters a day which sometimes is a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Regardless of the length of the chapter, we do four chapters a day. And that will get you through the Bible in less than a year. And it's extremely important that, uh, that we're reading. And, you know, and, and this is the purpose of the sermon. You know, I'm not preaching anything new. It's probably most of you have already heard this. You already know that you should be reading the Bible. But I want, you to, lift, I want to encourage you and, and edify you and show you. Look at how important this is. You want to get your doctrine right. You want to understand whether the things that you're being taught is true. You need to be in your Bible daily. You need to treat it as your daily food. Let's keep reading here in, in, in Deuteronomy 8. Jump down to verse number 10. The Bible reads, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through the great, that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint who fed thee in the wilderness with 
with manna which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. He's giving the warning, hey, when things get really good, when you're blessed, when you've got wealth, when you've got food, when everything's going great for you, I don't want you to forget about the Lord. Don't forget about the hard times you went through. Don't forget what he saved you out of. Don't forget that you were in Egypt and he led you through the wilderness and there was drought and there was all these perils. You had scorpions. You had all kinds of things to hurt you and God got you through safely. Don't forget about that. But you know what's going to make you forget about that? When you're not in his word. When you're not hearing from him. When you're not looking at his commandments, you're going to forget the commandments. When you're not getting it in your heart daily and, and getting that daily food, it's a lot easier to forget about God that way. And he's saying, you need to remember. You need to remember the commandments. Remember what I saved you out of. And everyone that's here that's born again has already been saved from sin. You've already been saved from your sins. Don't forget that. Don't forget about the punishment of hell. Don't forget about the things that God has saved you from. Don't forget just because things are comfortable for you right now that you still need to be hearing from the Lord and keeping him in your memory very, very, very closely. When the people forgot the Lord and went and served other gods, it's because they weren't reading, because they haven't read. When the people get into sin, it's because they haven't been reading. They haven't been getting those, the commandments in their brains. They go, no, I can't be doing this. Look at how God deals with this. I can't do it. When people get false doctrine, it's because they haven't read. When people have a zeal to serve God, but it's not according to knowledge, it's because they haven't read. And I want people to be zealous and serve God, but let's do it the right way. Let's do it the way that God said. Let's not be the Nadab and Abihu that were killed because they offered strange fire before the Lord because they thought they were offering God some great thing, but they didn't do it right. Let's not be like um, Cain, right? Who offered up the best works of his hands and not what God had wanted him to do. You know, these people who, whether through ignorance or willfully, did something wrong. Let's not at least be ignorant. I can't help you if you're going to do something willfully wicked. But I can help you not to do it uh, ignorantly. And, and, and you need to help yourself to not be ignorant by reading your Bible. If you have not read your Bible even one time, cover to cover, ever, how do you know what you're missing? You don't know. You don't know what you haven't read. You don't know what you don't know. And there's no way you could be sure, really, about a lot of things that you hear taught from the Bible, if you haven't even read through it. You know, everybody needs to at least have gone through the Bible one time if you're saved. You have to. I mean, if you haven't done that, I would put that up to, to the top of your priority list. Say, I haven't done this. I'm saved and I've never read through the Bible cover to cover one time. Make that a priority. Get that done. But then don't just stop there. Keep reading. Make it a priority just as much as eating food is in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful words of life, dear God. We thank you for providing us all the clear instruction that we need. And God, our lives will get so much better if we can just read your Bible, if we can let those words sink down because you've given us the guidance that we need. You give us the truth. You give us the right way, dear Lord. Help us never to, to depreciate that, to put the value of your words down so low that we don't even read them. That we don't even, you know, we have so much access today. Things are so easy with, with the accessibility of Bibles, dear Lord. They're, they're, they're so cheap. I mean, we give them away for free. We, you know, everybody has no excuse. There's no excuse um, available for someone not having the Word of God in their hands today, dear Lord. But just because the, the, the value of the price of the actual literal physical book is so cheap, dear Lord, let us always keep the value and the price of your words very, very high in our hearts and in our lives, dear Lord, that we wouldn't just devalue it, its, its, um, its value in the spirit, dear Lord, or that you would help us to, to recognize the importance and that we would continually read. And I believe just as much as we eat food, we ought to be reading your word. Three times a day, I think, is a great schedule for reading your word and the keeping it with us throughout the day, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.